Praise the Lord. Well, thank you very much. I tell you, I am excited about this week. Uh, boy, the praise and worship is powerful today. Thanks to all of our praise and worship leaders and the choir and just everything. And I tell you, it truly, like this up here, it says it's the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. And that's exactly what's happening. I'm supposed to be receiving an offering right now, but I'm not sure I'm going to do that. So uh, I'm just warning our ushers. I don't know when I'll do that. We may or may not receive an offering, but I just felt like the Lord was impressing on me. that you know, God is so much greater than any of us know. And it's only what we know about the Lord that releases his power in our life. It's what we don't know that's destroying us. And this is why we started Karis Bible College. This is actually why I started in ministry, that next week will be my 55th anniversary of the Lord touching my life. And I tell you, I didn't know what I was missing. But I encountered the Lord in a supernatural way. And I mean, I just immediately knew that I had to spend the rest of my life trying to share with other people. And of course, it's been a process, but that's been the desire of my heart. And uh, we're now seeing it happen through Karis. We see people come in one way and leave another way. And it's not that God just does this for a few people. I even tell people when they're praying about coming to Karis, I say, you have to have a word from God not to come. I mean, this is good for anybody. You would have to have God tell you he has something else for you not to come because anybody that comes here would be blessed. And uh, just like Julianne was sharing, boy, she was a mess when she came here. <laughs> and really, we could say that about all of us. Before Jesus got hold of us, that song about the blood, it's only because of what Jesus has done that any of us have been changed and I just want to encourage you that this, this is what Karis is all about. I know many of you are here checking it out and wondering. The very fact that you're here shows that God has already been speaking to you and preparing your heart. And I tell you, if you desire to know the Lord better, then this is a place for you. It's not perfect, but man, it's the best thing I've ever seen. It's really awesome. Let me share this verse with you out of Hosea chapter 4. Verse six, and most people know the first part of this. It says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy, of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Now, praise God, through Jesus, we've been redeemed from the curse and the rejection that's in the latter part of this, but it's still true that God's people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. And over here in 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, it says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and of our Savior. I'm going to go on and read a couple of verses, but you know that very first verse, the introduction, he says that you have like precious faith with me. Peter is the one that his shadow would walk he would walk in his shadow, would touch and heal people. Peter raised Dorcas from the dead. Man, Peter was the one that walked on the water. Did you know you have that kind of faith? He says he's writing to people with like precious faith. If you look that up in the Greek, it's talking about you have the same identical faith that Peter has. And yet most people think, no, that's not me. Yes, you do. You have that. You just don't know how to use it. First of all, you can't use something you don't know you have. And most people are praying and saying, oh God, just give me more faith. You don't need more faith. What you need is the knowledge of what you've already got. Over in Philemon chapter one, verse six, uh, Paul was praying a prayer for his friend Philemon. And he says, I pray that the communication of your faith becomes effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Your faith doesn't become effectual by asking God for more, by living holy, by doing all of these things that so many people are involved in. Your faith becomes effectual when you begin to understand and acknowledge what you already have. Again, God's people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. The truth is God's already done everything. Jesus has done everything. And all we're doing here is just taking the things that God has revealed to us and sharing them with you. And we have 
a tremendous staff here. I mean, people come because they've seen me on television and they come because they want to learn more. But when they get here, they find out they like all of the other instructors much more than me, which I think is just great. That's good because I'm the one that asked them all to come. <laughs> Amen. But I mean, we got powerful, powerful instructors in this school. And what we're doing is just taking the things that God has shown us that has changed our lives and sharing it with you. And one of those things right here, you have the same faith that Peter had. If you say, well, that's not me, well, then just tear 2 Peter out of your Bible because that's who it's written to. Unless you acknowledge that you have the same precious faith that, that Peter had, well, then this book isn't for you. And he goes on to say in verse two, and he says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Again, most people are praying for peace. They're asking God to give them peace. We have so, so many weird things happening today. People committing suicide, embracing depression. It's become like a pandemic that people are dealing with this. And they're praying. Christians are asking God to please help them over these things. This says grace and peace is multiplied unto you through the knowledge of him. If you have a lack of peace, if you have a lack of joy, if you have a lack of just enthusiasm for life, it's because you don't have the proper knowledge. If you knew what God has done for every one of us, I guarantee you, man, you, you would be so excited when you wake up in the morning, it'd be like, Jesus, another day. This is gonna be an awesome day. That's the attitude. If you get up in the morning and talk about, oh man, Blue Monday or whatever, and then on Friday you go TGIF, you're missing life. Man, you ought to be experiencing the joy of the Lord. And again, it's tied to the knowledge that you have. If you've got any problem in your life, it's really because you don't understand fully what God has done. None of us fully understand it, but to the degree that we've been able to renew our mind, we are experiencing a supernatural victory. And then in verse three, it says according. The word according means in proportion to or to the degree of. So you experience grace and peace multiplied unto you according to, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. That is one radical statement. Whatever it is that you need, if there's people that came here and if you need healing today, healing comes through the knowledge. It says all things. If you need finances today, that comes through the knowledge of God. If you need joy and peace today, it comes through the knowledge of God. Anything that you need, anything. If you look this up in the Greek, it means anything <laughs> that you need comes through the knowledge of God. Again, our, God's people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. I know in some ways this sounds too simple, but it really is as simple. It's not easy. The hardest thing you'll ever do is unplug from the way that this world thinks and renew your mind. You know, a verse that the Lord used to change my life back 55 years ago, Romans 12, 1 and 2 where in the verse one, he beseeched us to be a living sacrifice. But then in verse two, it says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And when it says be not conformed, that word there means to pour into the mold. Sad to say, most of our thinking has been influenced, molded, shaped by this culture that we live in, that this culture is so off base that they can't even figure out if they're a man or a woman. It's real simple. It's real simple. We actually had a discussion one time about what's going to happen if a transgender comes and wants to do something. I said, I'm just pull down their pants and check. And I said, however your plumbing is, that's who you are. Amen. And I don't care how you feel today, but we've got people that are so messed up. They can't figure out which restroom to go into. They, they, they think that by getting rid of the police, it's going to be safer. I tell you, this world has lost its mind. And sad to say, we've been formed by this. We've been shaped by this. And if you want to experience the real power of God in your life and the victory in your life, which I know you do, that's the reason that all of us are here. 
All of us are here because we know that there's more than what we're experiencing. If you want to experience it, it comes through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. And then in verse four, it says, whereby, talking about this knowledge, this knowledge has given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And so this says that everything that you will ever need comes through the knowledge of God. And again, religion is just substituted so many other things. It comes through fasting and prayer and through going to church and being holy. And we, we substitute all of these other things that have their place. But the thing that is missing in most people's life is just the proper knowledge and understanding of God. And it's that knowledge that gave us these exceeding great and precious promises. This word outside of Jesus coming and redeeming us and then the Holy Spirit being left to minister to us. This word is the greatest gift that God has ever given us because this is how we know him. And this is a Bible college. We've actually had other people come to this Bible college from other Bible colleges and they said that they spent, one guy told me he spent four years in a seminary and never opened the Bible, never studied the Bible. They read books about the Bible. They read theological you know, dissertations on it. But this is a Bible college. If you come here in my class, you have to read through the Bible in one year. And if you don't, that's 20% of your grade. So if you made 100 on everything and didn't read through the Bible, the best you could do is 80%. It is a Bible college. This is our textbook. This is the greatest gift that God has ever given us. And it's only because people don't know this that they're confused about all of these things today. And the Bible makes it so clear. I'm promising you preparation time is never wasted time. Regardless of what you feel that God has called you to do, you need to be prepared. You know, we are trying to encourage people that even if their children or grandchildren are, have to go to a secular college to get some kind of a degree in order to do what God has called them to do, people ought to come here at least for one or two years and get a foundation in the word before you throw them to the wolves. You know, the statistics are that 80% of Christian youth renounce their salvation. They fall away from their faith in the first year of college. College is woke. College is indoctrinating people with wrong thinking, critical race theory, and all of this junk that's going on. Plus, it costs you an arm and a leg. And man, there's some people that'll never be able to pay back their student loans. We, we have a really low tuition here. You know, all of the things that we've built, my ministry has built all of these facilities. We don't charge anybody here for this. We've got a, at least a half a billion dollar building program that we are in the process of trying to do. It could be up to a billion dollars. We're going to be building activity center, student housing for over a, a thousand students and an and athletic center and um, hotel and conference center and a performing arts center. And we're just doing all kinds of things. We aren't charging you for any of this. I'm, it's amazing. This is best deal going. Plus, I guarantee you the content, what you're going to get is better here than what you'd get in some woke university. Man, this will change your life. And this is a God idea. You know, I won't take time to go into the whole thing, but I've been in ministry now for 55 years. Next week will be 55 years. And I've been ministering in lots of different ways. I've uh, traveled a lot. I've pastored three little churches. And I had a lot of people ask me about starting a Bible school. And I said, no, I didn't want to start a Bible school. And it's a long story, but God spoke to me on uh, July the 22nd, I think it was 1993, and told me, I was in England, and told me that I was supposed to start a Bible school. And that was the furthest thing from my mind. I'd actually said, I'll never have a Bible school. And it was just so out of the blue, this desire that all of a sudden hit me for a Bible school that I said, this has got to be God. And it was God. It was God that supernaturally put all of this together. This facilities that we have, it's God. 
And again, I wish I had better words to prove that to you, but I'm telling you, this is God that started this. The Lord did this because he wants people to renew their mind and begin to start experiencing this again. All of the things that pertain to life and godliness come through knowledge. So it's God that started it. You know what I'd like to do? If, if they've got that little video that we call the Little Star Video, I think this is an abbreviated version of it, but it will give you a little bit of an idea about the, this facility right here is something that a man named Gilbert Jackson got born again, died within 11 days of being born again, and he dedicated this property to Christian education and saw these buildings. Without me knowing that, 16 years later, I built these buildings and his children told me this is what he saw. So look at this little video and I'll, I'll be right back. Since answering the call to start Karis Bible College, Andrew Womack has spent the last three decades fulfilling a vision bigger than himself. A vision so grand and so beautiful that God shared a vision of it with a land developer as a promise that his beloved property would one day teach others about Jesus. In 1992, real estate investor Gilbert Jackson received a terminal cancer diagnosis. Though his daughter Debbie and her husband Mark had often shared their faith with him, his conversion came through his humble caregiver, Merlene. Merlene said she just kept, you know, repeating scripture and whatever God would put on her heart to say and he literally visualized Jesus standing in the door, extending his hand to him um, to step through the door and become a believer. And he did. He took Jesus' hand and he stepped through that door and the rest is history. Upon dedicating his life to the Lord, Gilbert had just 11 days to live. But in that brief time, he told his daughter that he wished to see his prized property in Woodland Park, Colorado become a campus. And with that, he had the following vision. A structure that would have glass walls so the students could see the beauty of Pikes Peak. He had always talked about his properties in a very business-like way. Now his focus had changed and he said, these properties need to be put together and used for Christian uses, Christian endeavors, Christian education. In the year that Gilbert Jackson received his vision, coincidentally, Andrew Womack heard God telling him to start a Bible school in Colorado Springs. For the next 20 years, Karis Bible College outgrew building after building until Andrew eventually purchased Gilbert Jackson's prized acreage in Woodland Park. But when he revealed the building design he had received from the Lord, Mark and Debbie were blown away. Without any prior knowledge of Gilbert's story, Andrew had designed the Christian school the dying man had seen in his final days of life, including the giant windows facing Pikes Peak. We couldn't have dreamed this. We couldn't have uh, sat down on a whiteboard or a yellow legal pad as we used to with Gilbert and, and figured this out. It was, it, there was too many variables. There were too many unknowns. There was no way we could have ever imagined this happening, and yet God did this. As Andrew and his partners come together to launch student housing on the Karis campus, this story reminds us that this is God's idea. This property is his land, and that makes it very good ground in which to sow the seed of his word into an untold number of lives. We all have a part in something that is bigger than any one of us. It is a story that is ultimately to the glory of God alone. Amen. So I tell you, this is not my idea. It's no one person's idea. This is God's idea. And I believe that God has put this in your heart to come here and to check it out. And we just want to tell you up front that, man, I believe God is drawing you here. I really believe that. It's changing people's lives. And this is what our whole life is dedicated to. You know, back when the Lord first touched my life in 1968, March the 23rd, 1968, like I said, I just started trying to tell everybody I knew. We actually divided the city that I lived in up into sections and we started knocking on 100 doors a day, witnessing to people. And man, it was not well received. 
And uh, I remember that, man, we had so many doors shut in our face. I just determined that I was going to get this next person to talk to me. I didn't care what I had to do. So, man, I was just praying and saying, God, give me a way to uh, get past. You know, they would, they would just be put off when you come and knock on their door. So anyway, this woman knocked on the door and she had her chain on and just opened her door a little crack and was looking through there. And I said, praise God, I finally found a Christian. And she looks at me, she says, what makes you think I'm a Christian? I said, you got this scripture written on your fence out here. And this woman unlatched her door and walked out on the porch and she says, what scripture? And I turned over to Philippians 3, 2, where it says, beware of dogs. I said, right there. And, and I read, I started reading in Philippians. And I got nearly through the whole chapter before she shut the door in my face. It was awesome, praise God. But I tell you what, I just had a desire to tell people and I was witnessing to people and doing everything that I knew how. And yet people just weren't receiving. And um, anyway, I got hooked up with a group called the Navigators. I don't know how many of you heard of them, but they actually have their headquarters in Colorado Springs. And uh, Dawson Trotman was a, a Navy guy and on the ship, he just had a desire to reach the people. And so what he started doing was having people come to Bible studies and they started a scriptural memorization uh, uh, program where you just memorize scripture. And anyway, uh, it's still going on. It's been going on for a long time. But one of the things that they taught me, they really started emphasizing that it's not just evangelism. It's discipleship is what God called us to do. And this was a new concept to me. I just thought I needed to tell everybody about Jesus and if they'd get born again, that everything would automatically take uh, care of itself. But that's not what the word of God teaches. You know, over in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, it says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That says that you're supposed to go into all the world and teach all nations. If you look that up in the Greek, most of the modern translations will say, go into all the world and make disciples. The Lord never told us to make converts. You know, I just watched the Jesus Revolution movie. Did any of you see that? Man, that's pretty awesome. And uh, even though that's wonderful and it was great that so many people got touched, just think about this. There was hundreds of thousands of people in California who were touched by the Lord. And yet today, California is one of the most liberal places on the planet. And many of those are people that got touched during the Jesus revolution. Am I saying that it wasn't genuine? What happened? No, I'm, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying they got touched. They had an emotional impact, but they didn't become disciples. And this is one of the mistakes that the church has made, that we've been out trying to get people born again, which, man, I'm all for everybody being born again. But Jesus didn't tell us to go get people born again. He told us to go and make disciples and teach them to observe all things. And one of the reasons that the church is not having the impact that God intended for it to have on our culture is because we have been emphasizing get saved so that you won't go to hell. And even though that's good, and if that's all that there was to salvation, that would be more than what we deserve and I'd preach it. But man, it's so much more than that. And there's so many people that are just in such miserable conditions today that they aren't thinking about eternity. They're just trying to muddle through today and figure out how they're going to get over this cancer diagnosis or over this, uh, you know, relation problem and things. And they're just dealing with things and they don't recognize that Jesus is for us right here. It says in Galatians chapter one, verse four, it says that Jesus gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Not just the one to come, but from this present even world. Now, yes, we praise God, heaven's gonna be a blast and I'm not discounting that at all, but I'm saying that Jesus will change your life right now and you can walk in victory, you can walk in health and wealth and prosperity and joy and peace and because the church isn't discipling people for this life, we're telling them it's all for the future, many people don't see the revelance. Or, is that the right word? Revelance. 
relevance. I knew something didn't sound right there. Anyway, they don't see how that the church has any impact on their life. And so they just, you know, a lot of people, they want to get right with God before they die, but they don't see that Jesus is going to help them in this life. Man, that is a total misunderstanding. Man, Jesus came to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly, not only in the future, but right now, not just pie in the sky, by and by, but steak on the plate while you wait. Amen. <laughs> Jesus came to give us an abundant life. And this is what the Lord began to show me through these people that were emphasizing discipleship. Did you know there was a man who was an associate with me for, I don't know, 20, 30 years, uh, Don Crow. And Don Crow just had a desire to go out and witness to people. And he was going into Colorado Springs and witnessing to people and seeing one or two people born again every day. And it was good, but... I got to talking to him and asking him, I said, so are, the, are you following up? Is anything being done with these people? And it wasn't being followed up the way it should. So we got to discussing, what can we do? And we came up, Don and I came up with this program that we call Discipleship Evangelism. And uh, it's 48 lessons divided into three sections of 16 lessons each. And the first uh, section is just the real foundational things about salvation, who God is, and all of these kind of things. The second set is all about how to walk in victory on healing, prosperity, marriage, things like this. The third section is all about how you become a discipler and go to disciple other people. And we've had millions and millions of people around the globe go through this discipleship evangelism thing. In Uganda alone, we've had over a million people go through there and we saw over 12 people raised from the dead through these programs that we were having. The people learned how to walk in the power of God and went out and raised people from the dead. I remember this one lady, uh, she came and we had to go through two interpreters because they didn't have anybody that spoke her language directly. So somebody spoke her language, translated it into another one, and then that one translated it into English. And so anyway, I had to go through two interpreters, but this woman came and told me she was a, a pastor, but she was a religious pastor, and she was just preaching condemnation. And if a person smoked a cigarette, she would tell them, you're going to hell if they did anything that wasn't, Right, she, she would just drive people away and her church went down to about 15 people from a hundred and something people to 15 people because she was so mean. And she uh, was fasting. She actually fasted six days out of every week for two years thinking she had to do that in order to see the power of God operate in her life. And I remember when this lady was talking to me, she was talking about that she became so emaciated she was nearly dead. And I remember her running her hand across my chest and saying, I was as flat chested as you were. <laughs> she just nearly died thinking that she had to do these things to please God. And then she went through our discipleship evangelism program and found out who Jesus really was and that he had done everything by grace. And this woman got turned on to the Lord and she went and apologized to all of the people that she'd been condemning and told them I didn't understand the word and told them these things. And anyway, this woman's church went from like 15 to a thousand in just a relatively short period of time. And as she was telling me this, she said that she, uh, they had a person die in their church and in Uganda, they, they do wakes where they keep the body in the home for a week or something like that. And people come over and visit with the family and things. So she as the pastor was over there and they had this corpse in one room and everybody was in another room eating and visiting. And she just snuck out and went in there. It was three days, two or three days after this guy had died and she just raised him from the dead and brought him back in where everybody else was eating. <laughs> And, and I tell you, they're experiencing revival. So my point in saying all of that is that our whole focus here isn't on evangelism as it's traditionally called about just telling you about how to get right with God so that you'll go to heaven. But what we do is tell you how to live right now and how to receive 
the abundance that God has for you. And as you implement that, not only is your life changed, but then you become a positive witness for the Lord and you're able to go out and minister to people. And so when we started this program, I remember Don went out and wanted, he was always knocking on doors and he went to an apartment complex and he changed his approach from saying, you know, do you know the Lord? Do you need to be saved? And what he would do, he'd just go and he asked the people, he says, I'm here to help you. Is there anything I can help you with? Do you need food? And if they needed food, they had started. Actually, this is how the Springs Rescue Mission, I know those of you that are visiting don't know about that, but the Springs Rescue Mission was started out of Karis Bible College by Don Crow and some of the people that were helping him. And they just started taking food out and if a person needed food, they'd give it to him. And now the Springs Rescue Mission has uh, housing for 500 people, an apartment building on top of that. They can, there is not a need for a single person in Colorado Springs to ever be on the street. They got enough beds for everybody. They are the largest distributor of food. They give over a million meals a, a year uh, out and they are the largest distributor of furniture and clothing and all of those things. And that started through this discipleship evangelism. They'd go knock on a door and ask, do you need something? And if they needed groceries, they'd give them groceries. And as they started teaching them how to prosper, they would wind up leading them to the Lord. And one of the examples that Don gave, he went and knocked on a door and there was this guy named Stephen and uh, a girl that he was living with and they were both high on dope. And so Don said, is there something I can help you with? Do you need food? Well, they needed food, so he gave them some food and they invited him in and he says, do you have any physical problems? And he said, yeah, I'm off work because I hurt my back. And he says, I can't work. And so Don says, could I just teach you what the word of God says about healing? And so for two or three weeks, he went back to this couple that were just shacking up with each other and they were doing dope. They were high on dope and Don just started teaching them what the word said and started teaching them. Didn't make, I'm not, I hope you understand the point I'm making. Well, I'm not against people being born again. You must be born again. But we didn't make it only about forgiveness of sins. We were showing the relevance of Jesus to every part of your life. And so Don just started teaching them about healing. And I think it was the third week that he was there. He was reading the parable of the prodigal son. And he was having this guy, Stephen, read it. And this guy, Stephen, was high on drugs. He was just barely functional. And uh, so he had Stephen read it. And right as he got to the point where the, you know, the prodigal son said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to return to my father and say, Father, I'm not even worthy to be called your son, but make me a servant only. And Don just stopped him and he says, what do you think is going to happen when he gets back to the father? And Stephen said, oh, I know what will happen. That father will tell him, no, you'll never be my son again. And he started saying all this. And Don said, well, read what the next verse says. And when he read that the father ran and fell on his neck and killed the fatted calf and put a ring on his finger, this guy Stephen says, are you telling me that God would accept me after everything that I've done? And Don said, well, read it again. And so he read it a second time. And he says, are you telling me that I could be forgiven? And God said, Don said, read it again. He didn't ever tell him anything. He just said, read it again. And this guy about the third or the fourth time, he just fell on his face on the floor and cried out to God, got born again, instantly came off drugs. His girlfriend got born again. I had the... I had the privilege of baptizing both of them in water and baptizing them in the Holy Spirit and started speaking in tongues and their life was totally changed by us just going out and telling people what Jesus could do. Not everybody is thinking about the future. They should be, but they aren't. But you know what? Everybody has physical needs, uh, financial needs, relational needs, and things like this. And if we were presenting Jesus and getting his life that he's purchased into every person's life, I guarantee you, it'd be like in the days of Jesus. You, you couldn't contain the crowds. They were having to cut holes in the roof and let the sick in through the roof. Man, people would come if, if we were offering something that was relevant to their, their life. And so anyway, this is what Karis is all about. It's not, if you're born again and you're going to heaven, 
Well, then praise God, you'll get there and that's wonderful. But if you don't know about healing, you're going to get there quicker. <laughs> and if you don't know about prosperity and joy and peace and all of the things that Jesus purchased for us, you aren't going to be the witness that God wants you to be. And I, you know, I've uh, met with uh, the guy who is uh, Mahatma Gandhi's grandson. He came to one of my meetings and I was talking to him. And, you know, Mahatma Gandhi was exiled to Africa. And in exile, he started reading the uh, Bible and he was convinced that Jesus was the Son of God. And he actually went to a Presbyterian church and was going to make a profession of his faith and become a Christian. And he was a black man and these Presbyterian missionaries were white. And because he was black, they wouldn't let him into the church. And Mahatma Gandhi said, I would have been a Christian if I hadn't have met one. And he went back to India and led 750 million people to independence, became the greatest influence that they had. And if people would have been a good represent, representative for the Lord, he could have led them into Christianity and have changed that entire continent. And you know, this happens millions of times over. Most people are not an effective witness for the Lord. I, I couldn't tell you how many times I've had people tell me that, man, I'm not going to go to church with all of those hypocrites. Probably every one of us here has seen people on television, radio, or somebody in media that was a Christian and yet wound up uh, falling into sexual sin and things like this and just wasn't the witness that they needed to be. And that turned so many people off. You know, the New Testament church did not depend upon a minister up on a platform to lead everybody to the Lord. They did all of the witnessing out in the uh, marketplace. They were just such an attractive witness that within 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus, the known world had been evangelized. In Alexandria, Egypt, which was the second most influential city in the world at that time, it was over 30% Christian within 30 years of the resurrection of Jesus. And the, the church didn't have television and radio, tapes, CDs, books to give out. They just were on fire for God. There, I went and actually was in the Roman, Roman Colosseum and I heard stories about that Nero literally put his fingers in his ear as Christians were burned at the stake and thrown to the lions. He put his fingers in his ears because the Christians were singing and glorifying God. They actually fought each other to see who got the honor of going out into the Colosseum and dying for the Lord. We don't have a lot of Christians like that today. <laughs> And it's because they don't have this dynamic. They don't really have the fullness of God working in them, which again, I tie everything back to it's the way that it's been presented. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You don't have faith for things that you haven't heard. If you don't know the truth, you won't be made free. Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. But it's only the truth you know that makes you free. And because the gospel has presented, been presented about Jesus died for your sins so you won't go to hell, but instead go to heaven. And that's what's been preached. And it's not, that's not incorrect, but it's not complete. The Lord wants us to have a vibrant relation. What we experienced here today with praise and worship and people loving God and praising Him in this life, not just for the future, but right now. God wants us to have an abundant life right now. And because it hadn't been presented that way, people don't have faith for it. Did you know the scripture says in his, uh, Exodus chapter 23, verse 25, that He would bless our bread and water. Would you put that verse up? And, uh, and you shall serve the Lord your God and, you shall and he shall bless thy bread and the water and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. Did you know that the word take and away is the exact same Hebrew word and it means to turn off. That's the only definition of it. He will turn off sickness. You don't have to just muddle through this life and deal with sickness and struggle. You can actually live a life to where you don't walk in sickness. 
I'm not condemning anybody who has sickness. We're all at different places and praise God, God will heal you, but you can also get to a place where he's turned off sickness on the inside of you. Did you know that sounds like heresy to the average Christian because they haven't been taught what the word says? I'm quoting a scripture to you. You go check it out. He'll turn off sickness. You can get to where you don't even get sick. You can get to where you walk in supernatural prosperity. Man, I'm an example of this. I've been so poor, I couldn't pay attention. My wife and I, we, when Jamie was eight months pregnant, we went two weeks with nothing but water. We have been extremely poor and yet God taught me through his word and I've been able to trust God and we now have $130 million worth of assets that are debt free, paid for. We got them in nine years during the great recession. Amen. It wasn't man that did it. It was God that did it. God has prospered me. We can teach you how to prosper. We can teach you how to walk in health. We can teach you about how that God loves you independent of what you deserve. It's not based on your goodness. It's all his goodness. It's not what you do for him. It's what he's done for you. We can teach you these things. And I'm unapologetically just trying to encourage you that it's the knowledge of God, understanding things that is gonna make the difference in your life. What you don't know is killing you. And we are here to help share things with you. And we, again, none of us claim that we've got it all figured out. I'm still growing and learning, but what I've learned is working. And I've seen my son raised from the dead after being dead for nearly five hours in a morgue, stripped naked, in a freezer with a toe tag on. And they called me and we just spoke and he sat up and started talking. And he's the one that works for me and puts up the screen and he's healthy. And the next year we had a granddaughter that was born uh, to a guy who had been dead for nearly five hours. She has a very unique experience that she was born a year after her dad died. Not many people can say that. I've seen my wife raised from the dead. We've, we saw a little baby raised from the dead right here. A 14 month old baby was put on the pulpit while we were on the platform, while we were talking and we just stood around and started praying. I think Mike and Carrie were here, weren't you? Praying for him and we had others and, and this little baby is just raised from the dead right here. We see miracles happen all of the time. And I'm telling you that it is not an anointing on one individual. This is not what this school is about. I'm not against anybody else and other people are doing what God told them to do, but we aren't building this school around an individual. It's not around an anointing upon one person. When, when it's my turn to go on, man, if the people that we've been discipling will continue in the same spirit, I guarantee you they'll see even greater things happen. It is not a person. It is the word of God. This is what it's all about. And we are emphasizing the word of God. And I just want to encourage you that if, you, if you're here, I imagine that you came because you have a desire. You know that there's something more than what you've experienced. And you're just here to check out and see if Karis is the place. It is the place. Amen. Amen. And I encourage you to come. And there is a satisfaction. There is a peace that will come when you are in the center of what God called you to do that you can't get anywhere else. I know that some of you are gonna be leaving family and houses and businesses and things and in the natural, it doesn't look like it's smart to do it, but the, the smartest thing you will ever do is to take God's word and just let it saturate you and reveal Jesus to you and it will produce a satisfaction, a peace that's on the inside of you that you can't get anywhere else. You know, I had an experience, I'm gonna quit with this, but I had an experience in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'd been, I, go, I went there for 32 years to one church and I held meetings every September there. And I had a partner in Charlotte that had a business that employed about 25 or 30 people. And he would always have me come in and tell the staff, that the clock is running. You listen to this guy as long as he wants to talk. And I would just talk and they were getting paid to listen to me. 
And after I got through talking, I'd go into the break room and they could come back and I would pray with them. And we saw lots of people born again and healed and things happen. And anyway, one year when I was there, I came out after speaking to the uh, staff and there was a woman, an oriental lady that was sitting at the reception desk and she wasn't back there with the rest. And I said, so who are you? And she told me your name. And I said, what are you doing? She says, oh, I'm the new kid. They just hired me and uh, they had me answer the phone while everybody else is in the back. And she said, who are you? And so I told her my name and she says, what do you do? And I said, I'm a minister. And boy, her eyes got big and she said, for who? And I said, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And she says, you're the one. And I said, the one what? And she said, she was a Buddhist. And she said the night before she was going through her rituals and burning candles and doing things. And right in the midst of it, she just stopped and she says, God, I know that you exist. I know there must be a God, but I can't believe that this is it. Would you reveal yourself to me? Who are you? And while she was praying, she said this ball of light came in front of her and it was pulsating. And she heard an audible voice saying, tomorrow I'll send you a man who'll tell you who I am. And she said, you're the man. And I said, I am the man, amen. And I was able, I was able to lead this woman to the Lord and got her baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was awesome. And I went out and sat in my car and I just can't tell you the peace, the satisfaction that I had knowing I was exactly where I was supposed to be. And I'm convinced that there's some people that have never had that satisfaction because they're just playing it safe. They're just doing what's safe. You know, water takes the path of least resistance. And that's what a lot of people do. They just, if it, you know, they pray, God, if you'll work everything out, if you'll make everything fit together, then I'll come to Karis. Then I'll do these things. It's my experience that the things that God has done in my life have never been the easiest things to do. I've had to see what God called me to do and head in that direction. And there has been obstacle after obstacle in my path. And yet I just uh, pursue it. And I believe that that's the way it is. Paul said that there was a great and an effectual door that was opened unto him, but there were many adversaries. He saw a man saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And so he knew it was God telling him to go. And within... 48 hours, he was beaten and in the prison in Philippi. Everything didn't work out just right. And yet, because he stood his ground, uh, man, we have the book of Philippians. There was a church established there. There was thousands of people born again. It was well worth it. You know, that verse that we often quote in Revelation chapter 12 about they overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And we quote that and that's great, but it goes on to say, and they loved not their life unto the death. I'm telling you, God made you for something special. God never made a single person to be a placeholder, to just occupy space. If your life isn't supernatural, it's superficial. God intended every one of us to do something special. He doesn't want everybody up here in a pulpit. He doesn't want everybody on television. He doesn't want everybody to have a worldwide recognition, but he made you to be supernatural wherever you are. I pastored a group of people in Lamar, Colorado. That's where Pastor Lawson is from. And his relatives, he's got, what is it, seven sisters that were in that church there. And anyway, their mother died. And uh, these ladies, they were just housewives. They all went over and raised their mother from the dead. And she got up and walked two miles into town and bought groceries and walked back. <laughs> just housewives. You don't have to be a five-fold ministry, but every one of us is supposed to be having a supernatural manifestation of God in our lives. And so if you know that there's something more and you're here to check it out, I'm telling you that this is the best decision you'll ever make in your life. I really believe that. Tonight, I'm gonna start ministering some things that I think will be a blessing to you. But this morning, I just felt like sharing that uh, I don't believe you're here by mistake. I believe that God ordained this and 
getting your mind renewed through the word of God is the greatest thing you can do. Amen. How about all of our students that are here? Would you recommend it? Yeah. Come on. I tell you what, God's doing something special. You're going to miss it if you don't come. <laughs> Praise God. Amen.